Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrews and welcome back to Frank and Grace Ann. Warm welcome to the Millers. We'd love to have you back. Uh, a couple announcements. Um, we're going to continue doing our cleanup on Mondays. Thank you for everybody that worked so hard on helping us get the church cleaned up. Uh, we're going to keep doing it every Monday at 9. So if anybody would like to volunteer to come out and help us with the shrubs and the beds, we're going to continue to do that. That'll be 9, no more than 2 hours. Um, we have a Lenten service this Wednesday again. And obviously that's all the congregations, all the churches are being involved. It's been a big success. And then after services today, we'll have a meeting in the fellowship hall.
Please continue standing. Let us join with our brothers and sisters around the world this day, acknowledging our universal need for forgiveness in Jesus Christ, using the prayer found in our bulletins or projected on the screen. O oh God, sometimes it's too easy to give up in our suffering and spiritually walk away from you. Give us strength and confidence to endure so that through our hope, your glory of eternal life may be realized. Amen. Nothing can separate us from God and from the love and grace poured out from Jesus. Hear and claim the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. It is my great, great joy to be with you again this Sunday, uh, celebrating a beautiful day. And I hope that during this Lenten season, it has been a season of beauty for you as we have uh, reflected and as we have taken time to examine and to spend time in meditation about our lives connected with Christ. And so we are excited to be able to share again this morning about all that God holds for us. During the course of uh, our time together uh, over this season of Lent, we've had some remarkable opportunities. One of those is the treasure that I hope you are finding in our Lenten devotional. What a wonderful uh, and marvelous gift that is for us as a church family. And I hope you've taken an opportunity on a daily basis to read the reflections and the thoughts of people within our congregation. So it is a wonderful gift, and I hope you take advantage of that opportunity during this season of Lent. Also, hopefully you've had an opportunity to join us for our community Lenten services here at the church. I'm very excited and, and so pleased by the hospitality that we are showing to our whole community. Uh, as hosts of this event, we have been just really blessed by the large crowds that have come, but also by just the friendship, the fellowship that we have as <coughs> churches together who share a common goal of sharing and revealing Christ uh, within our community. Um, so what two wonderful opportunities, and there will be others that will be coming up as we <coughs> continue this celebration of our preparation during Lent for the coming Easter season. So, Also, I hope that you have already kind of noticed as well while we are sharing together, and we have different preachers from time to time, obviously, uh, but I hope that you're noticing that we've been focusing on a central topic, and that topic is the cross. Very uh, important that we do. And, and we've picked out the idea that the cross for us as God's people is first of all a symbol of God's great love for all of us. We've also uh, figured as well that the cross, in addition, not only is a symbol of God's love, but it's also a symbol of God's power to save. For each of us, dead in our own sins, as God has sent Christ to die on the cross for your sins and for mine, that we might have eternal life through Him. And then, not only that, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the cross as well, a symbol for our, yours and mine, our discipleship. And so this morning I'd like to read for you our text. We find it in, uh, in Luke, and don't have my glasses, so I'll stumble through this. <laughs> uh, this is Luke 14, 25 through 33. That would probably confuse me. Probably looks better than mine, though. <laughs> and color coordinated, too. I like that. 
Uh, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you say, for if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build that wasn't able to finish. Or suppose, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send the delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. <coughs> In the same way, none of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. These are God's words of good news for us. Let's call us as we bow. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your good news. And as we share and as we read it, as we hear it, O oh God, may it become good news for us now. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. These are very difficult and hard words. What does it mean that we should hate our father and mother, our wife, our children? Doesn't the Bible say that we are to love one another? Doesn't the Bible say the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments is honoring our mother and father? Didn't uh, Paul say in Ephesians that uh, the husband should love his wife like Christ loved the church? So what, what is Jesus trying to tell us in these passages? And, and what does he mean when he says, if we don't give up everything, we can't be his disciple? These are all important questions that we have in trying to understand this passage in which Jesus is speaking to a crowd. And as he uh, is, is doing that, a crowd has gathered. And, and that large crowd is very typical for Jesus of all of the, the crowds that that would gather. Sometimes the crowds would be as much as five or 10,000 people we know from his feedings with the fishes and the loaves. We know that large crowds followed him everywhere. And there were many different reasons why the crowd was there. Some were there because they had heard of who Jesus was and they wanted to come and see if whether or not he really was that one who was to come that John the Baptist spoke of, that one who was going to be their Messiah. Others came because they had heard that he was able to, to take care of their daily bread, to turn stone into bread, and to feed them with fishes and loaves. Others came simply because there were a large crowds gathered around and they could take advantage of those crowds with pickpockets and thievery and other things. So there are a lot of different people who are gathered around Jesus in this time and in this place. And, and in the midst of that whole large crowd who are just following on Jesus and what he is saying, Jesus asked them 
to take a step back. He has a crowd that is ready to do anything, and he, in fact, says some things that make them pause and make a consideration about what it means to be his follower, his disciple, one who is with Jesus. And so the first thought that Jesus says is this idea about considering the call that Jesus is asking, not only that for them, but for us as well during this season of Lent. Considering the call. What is he asking us to do? I was with, uh, I was with my uh, grandson not long ago, and uh, he uh, saw a bunch of change on the table uh, by the bed, and uh, he said, Grandpa, can I, can I have that nickel? I said, well, yeah, you can, you can have the nickel, but you can have the, the dime if you want. He said, no, I want the nickel. And I started going, hmm. He probably thinks that because the nickel is bigger than the dime, that the nickel is probably worth more. Uh, and I said, you can have the dime, but he said, no. And, and what I found out is, uh, he wanted the dime, I mean the nickel, for a whole different reason. <coughs> he wanted the nickel because at Christmas time, he had gotten this monster bag. Okay, and this monster bank operates like this. There's this hand that comes up and over, and then it scoops up the coin and racks it into the bottom of the bank. And what he had found out was the dime was too small and too light, and the hand couldn't really grab it. The nickel was thicker and bigger and had no trouble at all. So, uh, in the same way, you know, sometimes, as I think about that story of him willing to trade a nickel for a dime, something of lesser value for something of greater value, that really is at the root of this story that Jesus is telling. And he's talking about, uh, first of all, for us, when we consider the call of being God's disciple, He's wanting us to know this, that there are simple things about discipleship that we must understand. And one of the most important is this. It is what Jesus would be telling us. He says it in a parallel passage to this uh, in another place. He says, anyone who loves Ah, come on, glasses. There we go. We'll do this a little better now. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. These are words in Matthew, in the 10th chapter. And they speak to this sense of discipleship that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is wanting to tell us this. He's wanting to say, if there is anything that is more important to you than Jesus, than God, then it's out of place. No matter whether it's a wife or a child, a husband, whatever those things might be, they have to find their place in our lives. Jesus wanted people to understand that if we are going to be his followers, if we are going to be his disciples, we must love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And what he is trying to communicate to us is this. If there is anything that has more value 
than Jesus. And it's out of whack. If all of the things that are important to you on this one side are more valuable than the love that you have for God and Jesus, then something's not right. And that's a word that we do need to hear these days. Augustine said it very clearly for us when he said this. He said, if I am to be transformed, if I am to be transformed, the loves of my life have to be properly ordered. The loves of my life have to be properly ordered. Jesus said it very clearly. Seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and let all the other things of life find their place behind that. Consider the call, says Jesus. The second thing that we, we learn about from Jesus in this passage is this, that, that if we are to be His disciples, we have made that objective evaluation about what Jesus is asking us to do and to be. We considered the call. The second thing he tells us is this, count the cost. What does it really mean to count the cost? To, to recognize and to realize that, that there is a price to be paid for the commitment that you're making. Count the cost. Jesus gives a couple of stories about uh, someone building a tower and uh, a king who is about to fight an army. And in those two stories, it's a, that idea is about counting the cost that we must make in our lives. I, I grew up and I kind of lived through the very hot summers of the 60s. And, and they were pretty hot summers. And, and I remember... Uh, one particularly hot summer, my next door neighbor, suddenly they were clearing off land. And then, and then I, I found out that the bulldozers came in and, and they plowed out this kind of large space. And, and, I, and I went over to, to kind of see what was going on. I decided that it was so cool to see all those uh, big toys and, and things, uh, landscaping equipment and things like that. And, and what they told me is that they were building a pool. And I was going, wow. And they showed me a picture of what it was going to look like. And I was picturing myself in the midst of those hot, terribly sweaty summer days of jumping into this magnificent pool. And it was so cool and refreshing and wonderful. And I couldn't wait. I was so excited. And then... They continued, and, and people came in, and, and they laid the block for the pool, and, and then I saw them bringing in the pumps and some other things, and the liner, and different things like that, and I was really getting excited at that point, and then all of a sudden, it stopped. And nothing happened for a while. And I started to get a little bit concerned after a month or two, and, and then some things that didn't happen. Uh, weeds started growing up inside the, the concrete barrier that they had put in, the foundation. And, you know, the weeds started growing higher and higher. And then, then after a while, nothing else was going on. And then, then I saw they had this great big dog that was getting out. So they put the dog, they, they put the dog inside where the pool was going to be. And instead of having this wonderful, magnificent pool, what we simply had was the largest doghouse in the county. <laughs> and I was so so heartbroken. And that really is the same story that Jesus is telling here, isn't it? That when we do a project like that, we need to count the cost. What is the price to be paid for, for, for being Christian in our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian in World War II, imprisoned by Hitler. And his idea was this. 
that if in his book called The Cost of Discipleship, he said this, God paid a high price to show us his love. God's grace revealed to us came at a high price. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If God paid that high price, we cannot afford to allow God's grace to be cheap for us. And so the words are these. Count the cost. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and he knew what lied ahead in Jerusalem. It was the cross where he would be crucified. Where he would give his life as a ransom for you and for me. So in the middle of that, he tells this crowd who is gathered around, ready to do anything, but he cautions them and says, count the cost. And he actually uses those words of cross. He tells them, take up your cross. And when he uses that image, they are reminded of an event that happens. Jesus was about 11 years old when this took place. He was living in Nazareth, and just a few miles down the road was another town. And there in that town was a man named Judas, the Galilean. And he was a zealot, and he was a Tempting to gather forces to attack the Roman government that occupied their land at the time. The Roman Empire found out quickly about this rebellion and immediately they sent their forces there. They burnt the town all the way to the ground. All of the inhabitants, the women and children, were sold into slavery. And the men of the town, over 2,000, were taken and placed on crosses all along the Roman roads and <coughs> crucified there. And they were left there for days and weeks and months, as long as possible, so that the message would come out. When Jesus uses that image, it's an image that causes them to pause and to understand the price of being in sight. And so we have these ideas of considering the call and counting the cost. And, and once we've done that, then Jesus says these words. Okay, if you've done those things now, then follow me. Carry your cross. That's his call for us in the everydayness of our lives to be willing to carry the cross of Christ in our day-to-day -day lives of faithfulness to him. That means that it's not always going to be easy for us. It means that sometimes the impact of carrying our cross are going to create moments, perhaps, of difficulty. It was Martin Luther King, who, Jr., who said, uh, Christianity is always insistent that the cross we bear come before, precede, the crown that we wear. He writes that from a Birmingham jail where he has been incarcerated for this movement of civil rights. It is a word that speaks to the importance for all of us of being God's people in the world in which we live. 
Jesus ends this passage by talking about we as God's people have to be salt for the rest of the world. Salt. And he's calling upon each of us as Christians to be that kind of flavor for a world that needs that wonderful taste of Christ and his love in their lives. Now, that's Jesus' word to us this morning about discipleship. And I'm blessed to be with you and to tell you that this church, over the course of its history, but most especially the last eight plus years, have been those kind of disciples. You have been those people who have done just this. You've considered the call, you've counted the cost, and you have taken up your cross and you've followed him. Your lives are demonstrating great sense of discipleship. <clears throat> and I'm so blessed that you have done that. And now we find ourselves in a time and a place where as we look around, we see the opportunities that God holds for us. If we are willing to continue to be His disciples, if we are willing to give of our time and our energy and our effort, of our talents and abilities to do the kinds of things that enable a church to grow so that we can not look in the past for the best days of our church's life, but look to the future for what God holds for us. I believe that can happen for us as we take upon this cross that God is calling us to take up. And I believe that that as we continue this morning to think about our own sense of discipleship, that God can do great things in our midst. I have seen the energy and the activity of our church. I want to challenge you, you know, one of the things, one of the things that we can do with our hospitality is to invite others. Next Sunday will be Communion Sunday. But on the 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day, that's a great day for Presbyterians, isn't it? <laughs> our Scottish and Irish heritages. <clears throat> At St. Patrick's Day, I want each of you to commit to asking a friend to come and be with you and be here. I'm going to be preaching in. The choir's going to be singing great stuff. What a great choir. I've got a whole batch today. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to bring a friend. Ask someone to come and be with you as we worship together. One of the great opportunities is to extend our hospitality to others within the community. So I'm going to give you that challenge, and I know that you're going to respond in a great way to that challenge. So we will look forward to that. Let's pause as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You have called us to be your disciples. And we're so blessed by the opportunity. Be with us now, O oh God, and energize us. Cause us to feel excitement about the future that you hold for us. And help us, O oh God, as we continue during this living season, to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.
blessing of music and how it stirs us, and we're thankful for our wonderful choir. This morning, I want to uh, take a moment to, uh, to share together, as God's family, our joys and concerns that we might have as we uh, continue in our time of worship together. Any words of good news? Anybody? Somebody got to have something to say? Good, right? Okay. The Millows are here. We are excited that they have joined us. Absolutely. We are indeed. Welcome back. It's good to have you from Richmond to visit our nice little rural area here again. We're glad, glad to have you with us, indeed. Uh, anybody else? Any other good news? Let me share this good news since uh, there's a little... Not only is it a beautiful day, but it's beautiful even more so. I uh, just found out that uh, my daughter, who had uh, a miscarriage uh, right around Christmas time, is now again pregnant. And we are very, very excited about that and uh, looking forward. And uh, she'll be uh, almost in her second trimester in another day or two. And, uh, she had her ultrasound and everything was great, so we're very, very thankful and looking forward to, uh, to that great event coming up for us. So that is indeed great joy. Uh, concerns, things that we want to think about and others that we need to pray for this morning. Anybody? Particular prayers that we need to lift up? Yes. Billy Sue Bryant. Billy Sue Bryant. Okay, good. Anyone else? Okay. Also, you'll notice the, uh, the list of those on our prayer list as well. Let's, let's pause as we bow together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the joys of life that come to us. Simple things like the warm sunshine, like just the beauty of daffodils springing up, or the joys of life that, that come to all of us, oh God, we are so blessed. It is an amazing world that you have created for us. And we say thank you. Father, for the relationships that are near and dear for all of us, we are thankful. For, for those who need our thoughts and prayers, oh God, especially to lift them up to you, oh God. We just pray and know, God, that according to your great love, you will give answer to those prayers. We come as well this morning, oh God, knowing that, that you have blessed each of us in our lives and we, we are called upon during this season of Lent to reflect not only on where we are in our faith lives with you, but how we can give expression to that faith life to others around us. And so, oh God, strengthen us, encourage us, give us, give us courage, oh God, to share and show your love to others around us. And it is our prayer, oh God, in these moments as we continue in our worship during the season of Lent, that we will be strengthened in our faith, and strengthened in our willingness be salt and light in the world in which we live. <coughs> Father, now we ask that you teach us together to pray as a congregation these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to uh, invite you as we close our service this morning. I'm going to invite you, uh, first of all, to remember our offering, and you'll see the offering plate uh, in the back of the sanctuary as you leave. It's our opportunity to, uh, to give out of that sense of having been given so much 
For God so loved the world that He gave. And now we have opportunity to give back to God, to share and show that love to others. And so we're going to close with our doxology and then our closing hymn. And I'm going to ask as we stand for that that you will sing verses 1 and 3. Of our closing. Let's stand together. Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.